Добър ден, приятели! Welcome to my talk. And I see a lot of people here. And first my question is, uh, why you decided to attend the session? Because you are actually interested in concurrency things or because you don't have an alternatives? <laughs> That's good. My name is Alexey Fyodorov. I'm an ex-Java programmer, but for the time being, I'm a conference organizer in Russia. We made several conferences on Java in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, in Novosibirsk. And if you're interested to attend or to make a talk, uh, we, can talk we can tell about this after the talk. That's what is this talk about? So it's not about agile uh, methodologies and things like that. It's about algorithms and programming. So who are programmers? Who of you are programmers? <laughs> and who are not? Okay, that's good. And my second question is, are you sure you need this talk? Okay, <laughs> it's the answer. So, okay. <laughs> Um, if you are a concurrency beginner, I have bad news for you because uh, the talk has some prerequisites and you have to understand, for example, blocking synchronization like locks and similar things. And for uh, non-blocking programmer beginners, I will like uh, introduce you in the uh, non-blocking algorithms, and uh, for advanced concurrence programmers, for people who worked with it, uh, with concurrency, uh, I will show algorithms related, uh, based on uh, non-blocking primitives. That's, again, if you don't interested in this topic, please go to other room, okay? You have an alternative. Actually, you are between, you are between a, like Scylla and Charybdis. Do you remember the myth about Odyssey, yeah? So it's two monsters, and my monster is Scylla because it has several heads and things like that. Great. So let's start. Uh, when we talk about concurrency, we usually talk about two main models. The first model is the shared memory model when we have uh, read and write primitives and this is how we usually write our Java code. We read some values, we write some values, and that's it. Uh, the second model is a uh, messaging model. So when you have uh, several agents, they send messages one to another and Usually, they can, the agents can send messages and react to uh, messages that they receive. Uh, and concurrency is about parallelism, yeah? And everybody knows the advantages of it. The first one is the resource utilization. We have multi-core processors, multi-processor machines, and things like that. Um, the, the second thing is the simplification, because if you have some concurrency-related framework, it uh, allows you to write simple code, and all the, complexity, all, the, all the complexities goes to this framework, and that's very good, again, because writing correct uh, concurrency algorithms is a big deal. And the third thing is, Async handling, for example, when we use concurrency, we can use async, async communication and uh, we get more responsible UI, for example. That's great. Uh, but when we use locking model, we have some problems with it. The first one is deadlocks. Uh, the second one is priority inversion when you have two 
or more uh, two threads with the different priorities, and low priority threads uh, may block some high priority threads. It's a simplification of uh, priority inversion, but uh, really the problem is if you uh, need you high, high priority um, thread to make some progress, uh, then some low priority thread may block you. That's the problem. And the reliability. For example, uh, we might have some problem with uh, lock owner. If our lock owner die and we need this lock, and it acquire a lock, the, 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 the threads uh, acquire a lock and die, that we have a problem because nobody can progress, yeah? And of course, performance. Uh, do you know an MDL slow, guys? That's very interesting. Low support that you have some operation um, that your threads do in loop, and you have parallelizable and non parallelizable parts of your computation. And in this situation, your boost is limited by this formula. If you have infinite number of threads, processors, whatever, you are still limited. So that's why uh, we need something else sometimes to speed up our applications. And while one of possible alternatives is to use non-blocking synchronization. Um, that's, suppose we have some volatile int, and we want to modify it only if it, ha it has some particular value. For example, we, need to, we want to modify the value to uh, 42 only if and only if uh, the previous value is null. So can we run it in multi-threaded environment or not? Why? And what is the problem? The problem is that there is no atomicity. It's two separate operations. The first is read, so we try to like, uh, get a real value, and the second one is set. And between these two operations, we may have some threads that do some other operation with this value. That's a problem. Other threads can modify value between these two lines. And usually when we uh, try to operate with, some, with such primitive, we use locks, yeah? The lock is like primitive that have a semantics, uh, two operation semantics. The first operation is lock or acquire, and the second is unlock or release. Uh, and these operations, uh, like that they have guarantees that one and only one uh, thread may enter the section uh, every time. So all other threads are waiting uh, before, before, before the lock started. That's great. But suppose that we have some magic operation that set the value, the second value, if and only if the first value is, uh, when the first value is equal to the first argument. So if you have null in uh, the first argument, it set your value to 42. If uh, the value is uh, different from zero, then this operation does nothing. That's very uh, interesting idea. And how we can simulate it? Use locks, use synchronized blocks. So the get is just uh, return our value. Uh, the compare and swap operation just uh, read the value and try to change the value to the second argument, and uh, compare and set operations returns true 
if our replacement is successful and it was and returns false if it was not successful. And of course, if you use logs, we have to use synchronized keyword. That's great. Uh, but the reality is that this operation uh, has uh, hardware support. For example, on modern uh, Intel and AMD architectures, uh, they have compare exchange instruction, and for ARM and PowerPC, they have pair of operations, load link and stock additional, that provide the similar semantics for it. And we have a uh, compare exchange based implementation on JDK, uh, Java Util Concurrent Atomic Package, contains a lot of frameworks based on these primitives. Uh, we are mostly interested in two frameworks in this talk. The first in Atomic Long. It's like long, but with compare and set operations. And the second one is Atomic Reference. That provides the similar semantics. That interchange the links, not the integers or longs. Uh, how it works? Suppose that we need to implement some counter. Counter is a very uh, simple uh, primitive. Uh, with two operations, get the value and increment the value. So if you, if you need to get the value, we just use uh, get operation. If we need uh, increment value, we do the following thing. Uh, first, we read the value, and second, we try to increase it in the loop. How it actually works? Suppose that we have a value, for example, 42, and several atomic counters try to increment at the same time. And the first counter, it will actually increase the value. But this, uh, suppose that we have several counters, all, all of them read the 42 value, and after that, all of them try to increment it. And the atomicity of the compare and set operations say that only one of this counter can actually increase the value. And all other counters, they will fail, so this operation return false, and they will go to the next uh, loop step. So they will do it in loop until they will successful. So that's this pattern uh, is cast loop, and this is very, it's like a basics of uh, non-blocking synchronization. That's how it actually works. Well, small pause. Do you have any questions about this part? It depends on the platform. Actually, so, some well, platforms uh, provides for us such a press and some not. So let's discuss about uh, let's discuss implementation detail separately because um, I tried to to like uh, uh, to don't introduce to some uh, implementation. Yes, that's my idea was uh, to to talk about algorithm, not about implementation. We can. We may discuss uh, implementation of later things later, okay? Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, also, when we have about... Uh, so the, the interesting thing related to this algorithm is that it uh, doesn't contain any blocking operations. And when we talk about some uh, non-blocking algorithms, we have several types of guarantees that algorithm provides you. The first is the like, uh, is a weight free. It means that uh, progress for every set is guaranteed. For example, in our example, f f for our, uh, for, for, for uh, the progress is maybe guaranteed for, for every thread, for every, um, uh, for, for every thread that's doing some useful job, yeah? The second guarantee is uh, log free. Log free means that Overall progress is guaranteed, but it's not guaranteed for every thread. And the third one is obstruction-free, where overall progress is guaranteed if threads don't 
interfere with each other. So again, back to the, uh, back to the counter. Uh, small quiz. Uh, is this algorithm weight-free or log-free or obstruction-free? Uh, who thinks that it's weight-free algorithm? Okay. Who thinks that it's log-free algorithm? And who thinks that it's obstruction-free algorithm? Oh, come on. Um, actually, it's log-free. Because for every particular thread, for every particular counter, this compare and set operation may fail and fail and fail and fail. That's, that means that for particular thread, the progress is not guaranteed. But if this operation is failed, if compare and set return false, what uh, does it actually mean? It means that some other thread make a progress. Some other thread already incremented the value. That means that we don't have guarantees for every thread, but we have guarantees for uh, overall system. And weight free is the most strong uh, like property. The log free is weaker and obstruction free is weaker. So if your algorithm is weight free, it's also log free and obstruction free. And back to algorithm. So I'm pretty sure that everybody knows what is stack, yeah? Stack is very, very uh, simple uh, uh, data structure. And usually when we implement stack, we have nodes and uh, references between them like this. So we have a reference to our items and reference to the next node. And what if we want to use our stack in concurrent environment? So what is the problem? The problem is, that, for example, we have first thread with own item the, to be added and the second thread with own item to be added. And the problem is uh, what, what we should do with top. Uh, if we have two threads that try to add the, the, the own items simultaneously, it means that we may lose some changes, yeah? We may lose one of the items. That's why we should, uh, we need some kind of synchronization between, uh, between the threads. And we may implement stack use, use, uh, using CAS. How we do it? Uh, so we will use atomic reference with a uh, have get and uh, compare and set operations that change the reference atomically. And how we implement push. So we have an item we, have, we want to add. We create uh, a node around this item. After that, we get a, a reference to the old text head. Uh, we, uh, add, uh, we like add a link, so uh, now our new, our new new head uh, refers to old head, and after that we try to change uh, our top link atomically. And if we fail, we go to the to the next uh, to, to to next loop iteration. Yeah, that's it. The same uh, cast loop primitive. And. If we are okay, if compare set returns true, so that's our new item added to stack. If it returns false, it means that some other thread already added something to the top. Again, we have overall progress, but for our particular thread, we need to uh, return to, uh, to the loop beginning. That's the same uh, primitive. That's great. And pop method is very, very similar. Use the same idea. Any question on this, guys? Great. Um, why I decided to talk to you about these non blocking operations, non blocking algorithms? Um, because it used some very, very interesting idea when 
threads can help each other. Uh, in the second part of this talk, we talk about uh, Michael Scott's QE algorithm, uh, and I will explain you some like simplification of it. After that, I show you an actual code, and I hope that somebody will understand what I'm going to uh, show because, uh, as I mentioned, uh, as we told Martin before the before the talk, every time. Uh, so when I was a student, I attended some conferences on mathematics and. Uh, programming and so on, and every time when some speaker tried to explain some algorithms, uh, it was a uh, facepalm. Because it is actually it's a challenge for speaker to explain some advanced algorithms, but I, I, I will try. That's my personal challenge. Um, again, uh, I think everybody knows what is Q. It's uh, first in, first out data structure, and then we have uh, when we talk about uh, queue in concurrent environment, uh, what does actually first in first out mean? Uh, it has pair thread semantics. So if several threads submit something to queue in same order, we uh, have to have the same order uh, on the other side of queue. Yeah. So first in first out is pair thread guarantee for uh, concurrent queues. That's, uh, we have node, uh, the only difference between Q nodes and uh, stack nodes is that now our uh, reference to the next node is not just a reference, but it's atomic references. Uh, and we have an initial, initial state when we have a special dummy node. It's a like, common pattern for it, so we have some special node to simplify the code. And initially, both head and tail uh, refers to the same uh, uh, dummy node. This is how, we, how it looks like. We have a head, we have a tail, we have some state with several elements, several items. Let's do something interesting with it. Uh, how we add new elements to this queue in uh, non-blocking queue? Again, first, we, the item with the thing we need to add the queue, uh, the item with the thing we need, to, yes, to add to, to, add to, the, to our queue. And first step is the same. We create some new nodes around it. Uh, the second step is to get current queue stale. And after that, we try to atomically uh, change the current tail next pointer. If we actually, if current tail is actually a, a tail, so the initial state of this pointer is null. So if this operation return, returns true, it means that yes, it was null, and yes, we change it to something new, to, to, to new node. And the second operation uh, is just to uh, move another pointer, move tail pointer to the new uh, tail, because uh, if we, so the problem is that we need to update two uh, references and to do it in, 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 in like in different code lines. There is no, uh, there is no uh, locks in this code, there is no um, synchronized keywords, so it means that uh, we have to be very, very like paranoid, and every string have to be every line of code have to be paranoid about what is the what the actual state is. Um, okay, let's. Uh, so here we have two comparisons. It's it's a simplification of algorithm just to show you how it actually works. Um, I just to uh, uh, use cast instead of comparing set the same, just to make the code uh, shorter, okay? And uh, let's uh, watch to, to the possible uh, results of these cast operations. The first one is, uh, the first possible result is that when both cast returns true. It means that we successfully updated 
uh, both pointers, both references, yes? So, and we actually, and we have new tail, and we have correct references between previous tail and new text, so that's okay, we are done. Success uh, is true, so we uh, exit the operation. Uh, the second situation is a uh, situation when the first cast returns uh, true, the second returns false. What does it actually mean? It means that we updated, uh, successfully updated uh, the reference from current tail to, new, to our new node, but we failed to update tail reference. What does it mean when it, it uh, happens? It happens when some other threads already updated uh, uh, this reference. So it's, it's okay. The second, uh, yes, I will show a little bit later, okay? Uh, the, the problem is, okay, the problem here is that uh, that's what, what does what does uh, what means that the first the first cast returns true the second returns false? It means that we updated uh, references between the nodes, but somebody else already updated uh, tail reference, and this means that they have overall progress. Uh, and uh, this, it means that already our core tail is, is not a tail, is, 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 not, um, is not already an actual tail. So tail already moved. And we update the tail reference to the actual tail, yeah? So it means that somebody else already updated the tail, so we have a progress. The third case is uh, the situation with both cast returns falses. What does it, what, what, what it means? It means that uh, our, we, we haven't update, uh, refer, we, we haven't update a reference uh, to new node and we go to the next uh, loop. So our new node is still not in our queue and we need one more loop to, to try it. After that, maybe we need one more and more and more loop to try it and hope that sometimes we, uh, uh, have a success. And the very interesting case is when uh, the first uh, cast returns false, the second returns true. What does actually mean? It means that uh, we have a situation when our current sale, uh, so what, what, what means that current sale has non-null uh, next reference? It means that um, other threads already updated this reference to some another uh, node. And we have a very interesting situation when we have a tail, they uh, refer to the previous uh, tail, and, uh, but, 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 but actually we have another tail. So they, it's a very interesting thing. When, um, when we have such state, all, only thing we do, we just update uh, this reference. And actually we have no progress in terms of we haven't added um, new, our new item to the queue. But we still have a progress because we update uh, a tail link. And it's a very interesting situation when uh, the threads that don't update, uh, don't add new, don't update uh, tail itself helps to other threads to update it. And it's a very, very interesting approach when some uh, uh, when some non blocking uh, threads, non blocking algorithms uh, help each other. So when we talk about blocking, uh, we usually talk about lock and unlock, lock back separations, and we have some invariants. So if we have a critical section be between lock and unlock, uh, we have some Precondition and postcondition. We have some invariants. In this situation, we have uh, so-called semi-invariants when we may have two possible situations for the for this link to be consistent, like in this 
case and to be like Semica instance, like in this case. But the, when the thread comes to, uh, to discuss and see this picture, it helps to other thread, it helps to, to, to make a state consistent, and that's very interesting. Yeah. No, not sure I understand, huh? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, it's correct. So uh, the actual implementation looks like that. But um, it's a great challenge for me to explain this. Because there are a lot of ifs, uh, there are several optimizations. But yes, sometimes we don't need second uh, CAS operations, and in this algorithm we uh, try to, uh, to use one or zero comparison set operations if we can uh, do this. So that's how actually a Michael Scott uh, algorithm skewy put method works. It's a nightmare, yes? I'm pretty sure if your colleague write this code, or code that looks like this, you should kill him. Because it's difficult to support such code, yeah? And this is how we actually pull uh, methods works in Michael's code queue. Is the idea the same, so I think we can miss it. Uh, what about JDK? In JDK, we have concurrent link queue that is actually based on Michael Scott algorithm. So if you uh, want to try it, you can just uh, uh, use concurrent link queue and do your own experiment with it. For example, performance experiment or things like that. So short summary for non-blocking algorithms. So they based on CAS-like operation that's implemented in all modern hardware. This use uh, CAS loop pattern, and uh, in advanced algorithms, threads help each other. Great. A couple of modifications. Uh, in Michael Scott's algorithms, we uh, should update two uh, references. Reference between nodes and reference uh, uh, tail or head references, yes? So uh, the first idea is to uh, avoid two CAS operations because uh, on some hardware, CAS operations are expensive. And uh, to avoid one of them means to get better performance sometimes. Uh, and I have a link, so if somebody's interested, that's following the idea that uh, we have no free lunch and if we uh, I want to avoid additional CAS operation, we need to use something else, and in this particular case, uh, we have doubly linked queue, so when we have links between next and previous, and previous and next. That's our, uh, that's what we pay for it. The second approach, the second, uh, like, modification of this algorithm is a basket queue. The idea is uh, very simple. If we don't need strong first in, first out for every thread, we, ha we can use some baskets and uh, build our communication, our, our uh, null blocking communication between the baskets. So we collect several items to the basket, and after that we implement the same logic uh, to our baskets. So the order inside the every basket is uh, not strong, so the um, items can change their orders. Uh, and if you don't need strong first in, first out semantics, it's a good um, alternative. Uh, that's it. Okay, short summary. Uh, first, Non-blocking algorithms are complicated uh, because it's, uh, they operate with some tricky things, 
like several classes, uh, advanced logic and things like that. If you use uh, blocking data structures, for example, array blocking deck or things like that, array-based structures, so it's pretty simpler than uh, not blocking algorithms. Uh, the correctness change checking is difficult because we need to think about such things like uh, linearization, atomicity, and other uh, things from Lampert theory, and it's difficult to support such solution. So uh, if you need uh, such algorithms in your runtime, in your production, please try to use... Uh, uh, Try to avoid to implement your, your own ones. Try to use uh, open source implementations. Try to use JDK implementations. Uh, sometimes uh, such solutions have better performance, but the keyword here is sometimes. So you need to do some performance measurements if you want uh, to be sure that your performance is better. Uh, and the main summary is that there is no for free lunch. The engineering, engineering is the art of trade-offs, and every time when somebody tells you that we have something new, very uh, like simple, that have very good performance, uh, that pay money to you, so ask, uh, the, ask, ask this person, so what is my payment? So what, what I have to pay for this? Uh, the most interesting part of the presentation is a literature. Uh, I recommend three books. Yes, it's, it's, it's a photo time. The first one is a classical book by Andrew Tenenbaum. It's a, my understanding that it's mainstream in the universities. It's, uh, we have a chapter six, if I remember correct. Um, that's, uh, it's about synchronization and deadlocks and things like that. Uh, the second book is famous uh, Brian Gertz with Coulter's books about concurrency in Java. And I think that the best in introduction for Java programmers to concurrency. And the third book is, uh, again, classical uh, book by Harold hinch uh, They use very, for me, they use very strange uh, English language and they use very strange examples. But after two or three chapters, uh, you, you, you begin to, to, to understand what's going on. And uh, all other chapters uh, will be like, uh, easier for you to understand what's going on. Also, these books contain some very, very interesting topics. Uh, like, for example, transactional, transactional memory. This is a very actual topic for the time being. So if you're uh, interested in concurrency, I think it's the best choice. So also, 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 three more links. The first uh, link is a link to Nitsan Wacker blog. Nitsan is a performance engineer in Azul. And he's actually a QA expert. He has a blog post series on it, so please read it. It's very interesting. The second one is my friend Alexey Shipilov, who's uh, actually a JVM expert, and uh, he's interested in concurrency, performance, and related things. He's also at JMH. So please read it. Now he has a very, very interesting uh, series of blogs. And of course, the third one is a concurrency interest mailing links, when, when you can read some interesting discussions, when we when, when you can like, ask your answers, so please do this. Thank you, so that's time for questions and answers. <laughs> Guys, no questions, no answers, okay? So, um, I, when looking at the code, I intuitively understand how it works. But, Great. Uh, gotcha. <laughs> yeah, but uh, how do you verify that it's correct? Because my intuition uh, may be wrong, and uh, there are very small details that one can miss, and 
Uh, are there any formal methods or even tools to verify that this code is actually doing what we intuitively think is oh, doing? Oh, very, very good question. So, uh, just back to code, yeah? So, that is the uh, example from uh, Michael Scott Q. Yes, yeah? so that's how it's actually implemented. Uh, to, ah, sorry. Please, uh, could you, okay. Uh, just a second. Uh, boop, 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 boop. One more second, please. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Oh, that's it. Great. Uh, the correctness of this code is a separate uh, and complicated question. Uh, we have a special theory, Lampert theory, that introduced some um, uh, terms like linearization, uh, atomicity, and things like that. Uh, on the other hand, we have a Java memory model. And uh, it's a challenge to, uh, like, to connect to, to these uh, models and to the theories. For example, if you um, will read, uh, if you read uh, Java doc for atomic methods and collections, uh, you uh, can read that uh, they have uh, happens before semantics. So the happens before semantics is guaranteed for this primitive and JDK. But to but for correct uh, like to get a, a, uh, to get some proof that that code is correct, uh, you need a special theory, and uh, the Harold Henshevitz book uh, have a has a full explanation of it. So, but there is several chapters before uh, this code uh, is considered in this book, so you have to read it. More questions? Yeah. Uh, when we are talking about non-blocking queues, uh, there are example implementation from Elmax Disruptor, ring buffer implementation. So, uh, yeah. You have Martin <laughs> yeah, in, yeah. in the room. <laughs> yes. Please ask him. <laughs> But uh, how you compare the, um, the use case and the performance of your non-blocking implementation with the disruptor? Martin, <laughs> could you please compare uh, uh, disruptor performance and uh, non-blocking queue performance? I think the disruptor is better, of course. <laughs> okay. They're different. They've got different use cases. Uh, the disruptor can function as a queue, but it's not designed to be a queue. Like its real strength is where you've got a graph of dependencies, so where you've got multiple consumers or uh, subscribers where they're dependent on each other, and it's that graph of dependencies where the real strength of the disruptor is. People often use it as a queue. It's not ideal for, for a queue in some of these cases. For example, the Michael Scott queue, some of the optimizations it has is uh, where you can work still when one uh, consumer is blocking another. That's why the algorithm is more complex. So for example, if you've got less threads, or so you've got less cores and you have threads available to run at a given time, some things like the Michael Scott algorithm are a better choice on a low resource machine. The disruptor may be a better choice where you've got more cores than available threads. For most things, it's always a depends. It's not one thing is better than another always. It's better than another in some cases. Thank you very much. <laughs> and maybe the last question. Uh, can I have a follow-up about the queues in the JC tools? It sounds, uh, I know you have some feedback on those two, comparing to microscope. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Uh, so yeah, there's some excellent cues in uh, the mic are uh, in Jesse tools. One of the things that's very much uh, a useful thing about those is they will tend to give better performance than the ones you find in the JDK, but in some cases have slightly different semantics. I think there are, there are some design features in the JDK cues that are based upon they have to implement the collections API, and because of that, it limits their design and it limits their performance. So if you want to have the exact semantics of the collections API, you need the JDK queues. 
if you're willing to relax, so for example, iteration over a queue. I don't personally know why anybody would ever want to iterate over a queue, but if you do, you need the JDK queues. And if you actually look at the code, there's more code to support iteration than there is to offer and poll. And also some of the semantics on these queues. Like you can see up here, there's multiple steps in putting something into a queue. There's multiple steps in removing something from a queue. Asking is something empty or is something, does it have space, is a very different semantic from something we part way through an offer or poll. So for example, if I offer into a queue, I've taken one or two of the steps, maybe I need three to complete. If you're part way through that and you were to say, is this queue empty or full? It may be a blurred answer because it's concurrent. The JDK tries very hard and quite well to give you a reasonable answer in some of those cases, but they're a conflation of design concerns that increases complexity. That complexity has a performance cost. So it's, you've got to trade things off against each other. Yeah, also, so the Michael Scott's queue is a multiple, multiple uh, uh, producers, yes, multiple customers queue. So if it's a very, very common case, if you need, for example, one producer or one customer, so you can change the algorithm, you can optimize it, so you will get more performance from it. Again, no free lunch, guys. Thank you very much.